Okay, our next example is a rational function. Let's sketch the graph of y equals 4x all over x squared plus 1. I'm going to set up my sketch of my graph using a Cartesian equation here, and I'm going to take a look at the function first of all. So here it goes. Okay, our function, it's a rational function. We know a little bit about rational functions. They may have um, vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Some may have an oblique asymptote, uh, depending on, on uh, sort of the degree of both the numerator and the denominator. And we should look at roots. We should look at um, we should we should look at uh, existence of asymptotes and endpoint behavior and domain and range. So let's let's go here. Well, first of all, let's let's take a look at uh, some asymptotes here. A vertical asymptote. Okay, so this is just for our function. So okay, our function. Why? We'll do the first derivative and the second derivative a little bit later. So with our function, okay, we have vertical asymptote when the denominator is equal to zero. And it looks like, okay, we always do this. We try and solve for x. It doesn't take us long to realize that there's no solution for this. So there's no vertical asymptote. Okay, our horizontal asymptote okay, is our endpoint behavior. So we want to find the endpoint. We'll do negative infinity first. I have my function. Okay, so I need arbitrarily large, large negative numbers. If I have large negative numbers in here, I have a negative okay, over a really, really large positive number. So a large negative number over a much larger positive number because of the x squared factor. The negative infinity makes the top negative, but then I've got a really, really large negative number here. So I really have okay, a negative value, and it's approaching a constant, 1 over a large number. So we're approaching 0 from below because of the negative aspect of it. All right, next, horizontal asymptote. Okay, is okay, the other endpoint here. We have to consider this one as well. So the same logic applies for this one, except this one's going to be positive. Okay, and remember this plus one really has no effect on it. So we have approaching zero from the top. Now on our function, that looks like this here. I'm just going to change this a little bit. Okay, it has no oblique asymptote, no oblique asymptote, okay, because of the degree. Okay. And I should finish this one off. Horizontal asymptote at y equals to zero. Okay. And this one has no oblique asymptote because, because of degree. So we basically have shown our horizontal asymptote. There's no vertical asymptote. There's no, no oblique asymptote. Let's find some roots, okay, on our function. Okay, our roots, okay. Our first root is going to be when x equals 0, okay. Let's, so that's going to be our y-intercept, okay. So when x equals 0. So when x equals 0, I've got y equals... equals zero. Okay, I'm going to solve for x. Oh. Okay, so I have, oh, clearly, okay, x equals zero. Okay, and I still have okay, the origin again. So I really only have one root. I've already labeled that. It happens to be Okay, an x-intercept, and it also happens to be a y-intercept. So one root, 0, 0. Okay, how about domain and range before we finish off our... Okay, so before we finish off our analysis of just the function. Okay, domain and range. 
range. Well, we need to go back to our advanced functions techniques. Okay, and when we have a okay, when we have our rational function and there's no asymptotes on it, our domain, okay, no vertical asymptotes, our domain is everything. Okay? Or we could say that it's Our range is a little bit more challenging to find here. And I'm going to save the range for later, okay? only because there might okay, be, it looks like on the graph, okay, I really don't know what's happening here in this middle piece. It looks like, like my endpoints are tending to zero, but there might be some okay, maximums, global maximums, global minimums in here. There might be a couple of local minimums, local maximums. Until then, I don't really know, and I can save my statement on the range until a little bit later. There's no real reason to put it in any order and do any more of an analysis. Range is often calculated, especially when it's a sort of a strange function that we're not quite common with. Range is often and more easily calculated, determined when you have a function, first of all, okay, or after when after you find local mins and local maxes. Okay, so let's take a look at our first derivative. Okay, so we're done here for a second. And let's take a look at y prime. Now I'm going to pause. Okay, our original function okay, is 4x and then x squared plus 1. I'm going to need the, okay, I'm going to need the quotient rule. So I'm going to pause my, my video here and perform the first derivative on this function. And I'll join you again uh, in a minute. And you guys can certainly try and do that as well too. Okay, picking this back up, I did a little bit of work here. Uh, I used the quotient rule to find the first derivative of my rational function. This work is shown here on the side. So I've got it worked down to negative 4x squared plus 4, all over, over top of x squared plus 1, quantity squared. I took the first derivative, set it equal to 0, and solved for x. And I found some critical points at uh, positive and negative 1 here. So now I need a sign chart. Okay, the proper way to do this is a sign chart to look at my critical points. So I've got my first interval below negative 1, and then I pick up my next interval from reading it from left to right, so x is between negative 1 and 1, and then beyond 1, so x is greater than 1. And I'm going to do my first derivative, and that first derivative, I'm just going to write it here. I have to include the denominator. I know we don't when we find the first derivative, okay? I know we just set the numerator equal to zero, but for the sign of the function, I have to include the denominator here. Okay, so now I need points. Okay, I need a point in this interval. I can choose negative two. I need a point in this interval. Let's choose zero. Always choose zero when you get uh, the option of doing so, and then x equals two here. Okay, so we need a sign here. We need a value of a sign. So when x is negative two, I'm gonna put it in here. That'd be a positive multiplied by a negative plus 4. I think we still have a pretty leading value here of negative. Our denominator is always going to be, because I'm squaring right here, it's always going to be positive here. That's good to know, regardless of. Okay. Now I've got a negative divided by a positive. Okay. Is it negative? Okay, so it's decreasing in this interval. Okay, this next one, when x equals 0, 0, okay, it's going to be positive. So I've got a positive interval, increasing. Okay. And then I've got a, okay, another negative here. When x equals 2, okay, that'll be 4 times negative 4. So negative 16 plus 4. Adding the plus 4 onto a larger negative number is not going to change that. Still going to remain a negative. Now I have a negative, and that's decreasing. Okay, so let's label these points here. Let's find the, the y coordinates. Okay, so when x equals 1, let's go negative 1. Y, I should just put this back up okay, in, my, okay, in my original function for y. I have to use, I have to use my original function here. This original function. So when x equals 1, okay, I've got 4 over 2, okay, or negative 2, sorry. So I have a point here, negative 
2 and when x equals 1, I will coordinate my, my corresponding y value is 2. So I've got okay, these two points. Now these two okay, are my points here. And it looks like get negative 1, negative 2. If it's going from decreasing to increasing, this is a minimum. And at this point, 1 and 2. And it's going from increasing to decreasing. This would be a maximum. Okay. Now, these are the only critical points. So these, in fact, may be, okay, and they will be, okay, okay are actually okay, our global min and our global max at these two points. Now I'm going to graph that. All right, so I've got a point at negative 1, approximately 2 here, and a point at 1 and approximately 2 here. Okay, and I'm not sure really what this looks like yet. I think I might have an idea. I'm going to use, okay, I'm going to maybe do the second derivative and confirm the rest of my, my findings here, but I think I've got okay, a pretty good idea of maybe what this looks like. Please don't go to Desmos yet, okay? We'll pick up, we're going to find the second derivative. Okay, a little bit of work here. We're going to find the second derivative. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to pause my function. What have I got here? Let's th let's set it up here first of all. My second, or my first derivative is a function. So again, I'm going to leave this work for you. I'll pause my video, calculate it, and show it to you, and we'll start her up again in a minute. Okay, I'm going to return uh, to my second derivative calculation uh, at this step right here in this state. Now, this is a pretty serious function. There's lots of work to do in the numerator in order to simplify that. But I'm going to take a greatest common factor at first. I recognize that I have okay, an x plus 1 here and an x plus 1 here. So that's what I'm going to remove here in this next line here. So I've got an x plus 1. I'm going to only take one occurrence of them. Okay, that leaves me with a negative 8x and then this other x plus 1. But it leaves me in the second expression with a negative 4x and a negative 4x squared plus 4. And I'm just going to close my bracket. And I'm going to simplify inside those square brackets here. My denominator is huge. I'm not going to expand that out here. Okay, so that's, I'm just going to leave this at that. I'm going to set my second derivative equal to zero. That means I can focus on my top just being equal to zero. And as I write this out, I'm going to actually expand this out and work on this. So this is going to be negative 8x to the power of 3 minus 8x negative, or sorry, positive 16 x to the power 3 and a negative 16 x okay and that equals 0 okay so all I did here was just expand and expand in here okay so now let's try it like this see if we can work on our inside expression here it looks like I've got an 8 x to the power 3 and minus 24x. That's much easier to work with here. Okay, let's so it's already factored, that's good. So my critical or sorry, my, my inflection points are gonna be up here. Okay, and right here. Okay, well I have no solution here. We've done this one before. There's no solution here. Okay, because that, that equation, I can't solve that equation. There's no values of x. When I square them, they equal negative 1. But I can solve this one. I'm going to take an 8x, put it as a greatest common factor. I'm going to have x squared minus 3. Okay, so then I've got 8x equals 0, x equals 0, which I already have as a critical point. And then I've got x squared minus 3 equals 0, x squared equals 3 equals plus or minus square root 
Okay, so this is an inflection point. Okay, and I'm going to set. Okay, to properly do this, I'm going to set up my. Okay, I'm going to set up my uh, sign chart for my second derivative. Right, just set this up a little bit. some values here. Here's my function, okay? It's going to be a little bit crazy. I know my denominator is always going to be positive, okay? And my function, okay? I'm going to use this as my top here. I'm just going to set up a real quick sign chart here in this interval here. So I've got, okay? So I've got x is less than root 3, and I go between 0, and I go from 0 of root 3, and then I go beyond root 3, and I've got to do my second derivative here, okay, knowing full well that my denominator, okay, is always positive, I better not, um, okay, I'll save that for a second here, okay, all right, so let's pick some points in here, so negative root 3 is about negative 1.7, so we can go down to negative 2, okay, we can go to negative one here, okay, we can go to one here, and we can go to two here. Okay, our derivative function, okay, is going to be, okay, this one, x squared plus one. And I think the rest of it was eight x to the power of three minus 24. A little bit hard to calculate okay, the sign here. Okay, I have okay. I'm done this work, and I'm going to just do this really quickly here. We want to put in our value, kind of a positive here, and that's going to be a large, okay, positive. Another positive that might be a negative here. I think the whole thing is going to be negative over a positive. Okay, so I've got a negative over a positive. Which is a negative here, so I've got a decreasing. Okay, so I've got a concave down situation in this interval. Okay, the next one will be okay. It's going to be positive over positive. I'll let you guys work that out. That's positive, and I've got concave up. Okay, then I've got a concave down situation. So I've got a negative over positive. I have to admit, I did do a little bit of cheating in Desmos at this point here. I um, just found this sort of be a little bit too unruly. If I do put in values, though, I, I, sh I should get it, okay? And I can get these values. I use Desmos as a calculator, too, so I kind of kind of do cheat. I put in this function, and then I put in the value of 1 and see that I get okay, a positive value here. Uh, similarly, okay, from the one third. I've got a concave up situation, so I've got positive and positive. K equals positive, and I've got concave up. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my, okay, I'm going to go back to my graph, okay, and see if I can, okay, map this in and get an idea here. Okay, my graph is way up here. Okay, so root 3 is about negative 1.7, so that's about here. Okay, so I've got a point here, and I've got concave down, concave up, concave down, and concave up. Okay, so concave down, concave up, concave down, concave up. Now my sketch is not... okay. Ideal or perfect, we'll do this in Desmos, but I've got a okay, pretty, pretty good idea what this function looks like. Our range should be revisited here, and it looks like our range is between okay, negative 1 and positive 1, and range is a y statement. Okay, so that's the last thing we want to do. Okay, so our range is an element of a real number system. Okay, 
divide lines between negative 1 and positive 1 here. Okay, well, last thing to do is Desmos, and I'm just going to pause this and call it up in Desmos and take a look at it. Okay, the last thing to do is just confirm our findings in Desmos, and in fact we do have uh, this uh, actual function <laughs> representing and looking a lot like the sketch of our function. You can see the asymptotes here, the horizontal asymptote. Um, you can see the, the local min or the global min, global max. You can see the root at zero. And I've also done, uh, did, I've put in the values of, of the function at uh, negative root three and positive root three. And that's about in this area right in here. Okay, so we see concave down and a turning point to concave up. Okay, and then a turning point to concave down again. Okay, from zero to positive root three and then beyond root three, and that's from about this interval all the way into that area is concave up. Okay, that's it. That's a complicated one, and you'll have one to do in your, one of rational functions to do in your assignment. So good luck with these ones, and we've got one more remaining, and I'll do that soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.